Welcome to the Learning Conversations, an Education Scotland podcast presented by Chief Executive Gillian Hamilton. In every episode, Gillian is joined by teachers, professionals and experts to unpack some of the big questions and topics facing the education sector in Scotland. Over to Gillian as she introduces today's guest. Molly. Molly, you and I know each other well. Um, you're a strate- strategic director here at Education Scotland and often on our podcasts I'm talking to a whole range of external partners but today's a wee bit different. As I say I work with you closely in a whole range of different areas and we're going to chat today about the curriculum improvement cycle. Welcome Molly. Thank, thanks Gillian and, and first of all it's it, it's nice to be invited back. I think this is the second podcast for you together. We did one uh, a little while ago when we started all this about artificial intelligence if I remember. We did, Yeah, we did and maybe it's that old adage about you get you get invited along for one um, visit and then the second time to apologise. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what we're proving today. Hopefully. Because um, we do have a name today, we're, we're going to chat about the curriculum improvement cycle as I brilliant. said which is really exciting so I'm looking forward to this chat. But hopefully, after listening to the podcast, folk who are listening um, will know more about the curriculum improvement cycle, purpose of the, the cycle, and importantly, how it might affect you as an educator in the coming months and years. So, Ollie, there's been a, a fair bit in the news about um, the curriculum, linking to Scottish Government response to Hayward, for instance. But can you explain to listeners today... In layman's terms, what is the curriculum improvement cycle? Yeah, and it's and it's a really really great question around that. And and one of the challenges I think we've got at the moment is we're using the words curriculum improvement cycle and curriculum review cycle interchangeably around that. But basically, we mean the same things. So so what the curriculum improvement cycle is for Scotland is it's a review of the Scottish curriculum, or perhaps a better way to describe it would be it's thinking about how the Scottish curriculum can evolve from where it is now. Mm-hmm evolve from all of the strengths that have been uh, highlighted in these many external reviews into something which remains fit for purpose in 2024 and beyond. And beyond. And and you talked there about um, the language, and language is really important. And and there was a lot of discussion at the outset of Curriculum for Excellence, and I know you want to talk a wee bit about CFE, but how did this review come around then? What's the background? You mentioned a number of external reviews. How did we get here? Yeah, so so again, it's a it's a good question because it because it feels like we've had a lot of reviews, doesn't it, around that? But I, but I suppose, um, you know, for the for the for the benefit of the people that, that are listening, um, the reason that we've had all of these reviews in recent times has been because of one significant review, which was the OECD review that was published in June twenty twenty one on Scottish education. Um, and I think the name of that review is really, really important. It's nice to sort of remind ourselves about that. And that was called Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence into the Future. So really, it was about the curriculum. What are we going to do with the curriculum? Um, and again, uh, I'm not necessarily expecting people that, have, that are listening to this podcast to, to, to have read it, you know, around these things. But the, but the review itself made, made 12 recommendations. Um, and interestingly, the subsequent reviews that we've had, uh, Ken Muir's review on the, the structure of agencies, the review that Professor Louise Hayward led on um, assessment and qualifications, they were all designed to, um, if you like, tackle some of the recommend, individual recommendations within the OECD review. So, so sometimes I think in Scottish education, we get obsessed by the last review. Mm-hmm. But here, what we need to do is we need to go right back to the beginning, the root cause of you know, some of these challenges that we've got and, and all these opportunities that we've got to think about that. So in this 2021 review of Scottish education from the OECD, as I say, it made these 12 recommendations. Um, and I think two of those recommendations are particularly prominent to what we're talking about today. Um, the first one is really, really obvious around that. So the first one was the OECD said that they should develop a systematic approach to curriculum review. Scotland should consider establishing a systematic curriculum review cycle within a planned time frame um, with a specific review agenda led by a specialist standalone agency. That was one, one of the things that said that, because of course we don't have a cycle of curriculum mm-hmm. review in Scotland. It's one of the challenges that we've got with curriculum for excellence. Um, <clears throat> but the other recommendation, which I think is really sort of tied to this, is that the OECD also said that um, that Scotland needs to find a better balance between the breadth and depth of learning throughout CFE to deliver Scotland's commitment to providing all learners with a rich learning experience throughout the school uh, education system. And in particular, 
when it talked about there is it talked about the role of knowledge, skills, and mm-hmm. attributes required by the end of uh, by the end of BGE. And and we know from from speaking to practitioners is that a lot of people would describe that language as being a bit vague, mm-hmm. you know, at, at, at the moment, and therefore open to interpretation, which has got its strengths, but it's but it's but it's also tricky when you're trying to improve the system mm-hmm. or lift the whole system. So two recommendations in there, Ollie, taking you back to that OECD yep. report. And one feels like this is the work then. Mm-hmm. That, yes. that that recommendation that you highlighted, the improvement cycle itself, is taking that one forward. But you were flagging there about, I guess, an opportunity. Yep. Recognising that CFE has many strengths, but an opportunity to pick up, you used the word there around perhaps willingness in some of the language, but to address some of the challenges that the profession have flagged for a number of years. So you talked a wee bit there about knowledge and skills, for instance. Why is this work important then to address some of those challenges? What are we aiming to achieve with the, the cycle itself? So so I suppose we're, we're, we're aiming to achieve um, a, a, num- a number of things. Um, but again, maybe I can sort of draw a little bit from what the OECD said, uh, OECD said when they were here in 2021, but also through the work that we've been doing since then, where we've been carrying out a whole series of what we've been calling sort of pilot curriculum reviews or curriculum review events, where, where we've been testing you know, with, with teachers some of the approaches that we want to do. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you've already mentioned one of them because it's at the top of the list. So one of the ones is around the vagueness of language and the curriculum documentation. That, that's something that we need to improve and work on, like in the, ne- in the next part. And again, I think just for the benefit of everybody that's listening here is that we've got to get that language bit right, right from the start. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there's a real danger, and I've seen this in, in other international work, where we all use the same words, but actually we're talking about yeah, completely different things. Different things. Yeah. And being really, really crisp on the languages that we're using, um, you know, at, at government, within schools, within local authorities, within our partnership agencies, has got to be really important going forward. And it's important that we take time to get that right. Um, another thing that, that we know that, that that could be could be built on and could be evolved is is what we call the technical framework. So. Um, technical framework, it sounds a little bit like an academic term, like in, like in some ways, but the technical framework is basically what teachers and practitioners use to plan the learning. So in Scotland, that would be things like the experiences and outcomes, it'd be things like the benchmarks, it would be our approaches to, to, um, to, 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 to moderation as well. So, so again, how do we get clarity you know, around some of these things? That's linked into the language around that. We've also got some persistent challenges in Scottish education. I think you'll probably sort of smile when I say this to you, because this has been around certainly since I've been teaching and, and probably when you were a head teacher and a classroom teacher as well, is that you know, we still haven't, if you like, got it completely right yet when we talk about progression, mm-hmm. you know, and particularly at times of transition from the early years into the primary school, as young people transition through, through the primary school, primary into secondary, and then on to positive destinations. So again, thinking a little bit, a little bit about this, and of course, that's linked back to the technical framework, which is linked back to language. So yeah. all of these things, you know, are, are, are related. And I suppose the last two things that are important there is really sort of defining around, you know, what, what are the, in, the important skills and the important aspects of knowledge that, that we, that we need all children to be able to to know and do in 2024 you know and 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 beyond because i think that sometimes we're not always clear on that and therefore you get a you get a a, a, an experience which isn't was inequitable you know across Mm -hmm. across across scotland and then then you end up with terms like uh, variation you know of course and of course it's no wonder that there's variation if we're not clear on actually what we're we require young people to be able to, 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 to do. So the big message that's been coming back from us in all of the kind of proprietary work for this is that people don't want to lose the flexibility yeah. of CFE, but what they want is clarity. Mm-hmm. So it's flexibility with clarity around, around that. And that's the bit where you know, we, we need to probably you know, work on in the next stage. And, and teachers who I've spoken to say exactly that, the clarity piece. So I think you're spot on around um, people aren't seeing we want prescription yep. or a, a prescriptive <coughs> curriculum, but I think that progression piece yes. and greater yep. clarity is a real consistent message from, from any of our engagement. I want to come back a, a wee bit to talk about how we're engaging mm-hmm. with, yep. with practitioners, but before I do, um, is this also an opportunity then, Ollie, because again, consistent feedback we hear is about a cluttered curriculum. Mm-hmm. You talked about breadth and depth. Yes. Yep. Is there an opportunity to look at, at the curriculum in the widest sense um, to p- perhaps reduce some of the duplication yeah. and clutter that teachers talk about. A hundred percent, there is, and, and I think one of the you know again one of the the, the challenges that we've currently got with curriculum for excellence is that it, it it is so open to interpretation. Actually, 
we're all guilty in classrooms of schools of cluttering the curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, around, around, around that. Whereas what we want is more clarity, as I've already said, around what we want children to be able to know, be able to do, what be able to sort of de demonstrate, but but also allow for that kind of local place-based learning, like with like with, with, within that as well. The, the the other thing that we're really really aware of is is at the moment in Scotland we, we take really probably an over complex approach to what you might call cross curricular learning, mm -hmm. you know, work around kind of core competencies. Uh, and again, you, you see that in in different policy that's been introduced over the last 10 years, you know, because of because of because of CFE. So um, people listening will remember DYW, you know, which is which is which is a, had a big focus on employability, you know, and, and careers and kind of career skills. Now, um, that didn't mean that that was absent from CFE originally, uh -huh. you know, quite the opposite, but it didn't have the prominence, you know, the consistency across schools and local authorities that it, that it needed to. Um, we've got a, a creative learning plan in Scotland. That doesn't mean that creativity wasn't part of CFE mm -hmm. as part of, but again, there was an inconsistency about how that was delivered. And of course, the one that everybody's thinking about at the moment, and I think we're thinking about it in the, on this rather dreek, wet day, you know, in, in, in Glasgow after a really sunny spell is, is learning for sustainability. Mm -hmm. It's an entitlement for CFE, but at the moment, young people get a very, very different experience, you know, of, of that because it doesn't always naturally fit into individual subjects and curriculum areas. So I'm not preempting the outcome of a curriculum review, but an opportunity then from what you're saying for some of that to be more embedded yes. as part of a young person's learning yeah. and as part of the curriculum. I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and again, I suppose the other thing, and I, and I use these sort of words quite carefully you know, when we started chatting, is that this is really an, an evolution about mm -hmm. what we're doing. I mean... Um, so we're not we're not starting from a complete blank piece of paper. In, in, in fact, that would be a really easy thing to do. People like starting from blank bits of paper because that's the easy part of the work to do. But we're not starting from a blank bit of paper. We're just going to the hard bit. So, again, if we go back to the different reviews that we've had more recently, um, all of the, all of the reviews are very very complementary around the four capacities. You know, we know that we might need to update some of the language around the four capacities. You know, for for for, for example, but the 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 the, the the idea that these are the purposes of Scottish education is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that in Scotland that we've got kind of four contexts for learning, one of which is subject areas and or subjects and curriculum areas, but the other is interdisciplinary learning around, around that, uh, the life and ethos of the school and opportunities of personal achievement. Again, these these are strong foundations and building blocks that we mm -hmm. need to include. So some of these other, um, these these more sort of complex cross-curricular uh topics that we were talking about thinking about how do we how do we integrate how do we integrate these but and also importantly how do we integrate these in, into what should become a proper 3 to 18 curriculum um and again not wanting to you know to to, to quote all of the different reviews that were, that were there but we had a, a national discussion for scottish education sort of fairly recently around that young people were very very clear during that documentation that they wanted more input around things like financial education mm -hmm. now you know, we know that through our kind of work that we've been doing in education in Scotland, that that one of the groups of young people that probably need some of the most important input in financial education are the young people that are about to leave school. Now, depending on subject choice, they might not be being exposed to you know some of these kind of key ideas and concepts that that they require to survive and thrive. You know, mm -hmm. in twenty four and beyond. So there's something too then about building on. You talked there about. We do, we're not starting from a blank page, but actually building on some of the really good work yes, that's already happening. I think so. You talked yep. about interdisciplinary learning. Yep, yep. We know there's some fabulous work yep. um, in Scotland, but we know there's probably more to do. Yes. So yep. I think that's a really important and that probably teachers listening today will be reassured yes. by not starting from a blank page, yep. but by building on some of the, the really good work. You talked about it being a, an iterative process. What are the timescales, Ollie? Well, it, the the whole of how we've designed the re review cycle, it's a it, it's a it's a big time frame. We're 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 looking at this as being a a ten year cycle of review, and I should probably just give a, a bit of background to that. That's just not a time frame that we've made up, you know, around these things. Is that as we were <clears throat> thinking about what a curriculum review cycle uh, or curriculum improvement cycle might look like for Scotland, um, we we did uh, two interesting pieces of work to help inform that. One of the things was that we worked with the OECD. Um, to look at how other countries review their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's normally done over about a 10-year uh, period around that. Uh, and it's got four distinct stages, which I'll maybe just talk a little bit about in a second, because I think that'll be useful. Um, but the second thing that we did is that we brought together a, a group of practitioners uh, and, and, and teachers and some key stakeholders from across Scotland as a bit of a co-design group to look at that evidence from the OECD and to sort of try and create, if you like, a, a, Scot a Scottish mm -hmm. version of that. Because, again, we've, we've learned from the past, and both you and I have been involved in many initiatives where... 
where in the past we've, we've tried to lift something from one system and retrofit it into Scotland. And we know that doesn't work. Yeah. So every, everything that we've, we've, we've done here, we've tried to do sort of thoughtfully and, and where possible with the, with the profession. Um, and this might be a, a good time just to mention those, those four areas of the cycle, if that's, if that's okay. <clears throat> so uh, again, we've used probably slightly different language here um, to, to what some of the other countries use, but, but, but broadly, the systems that seem to do this well have a have a four stage model. So the th- the first part of the model is uh, is basically around gathering gathering evidence around that. So everything is evidence informed, as you as you would expect. Uh, and normally uh, the cycle of the review would would start with something similar to the national discussion that we had, you know, a couple of a couple of years ago, to make sure that the curriculum, you know, and, and the and the, the the guiding light of the, of the mm-hmm. compass of the curriculum is still fit for purpose. If that makes sense, if that makes sense. Um, the second part of it then is uh, is thinking a little bit then around um, engaging in co-creation with the profession, do, 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 doing that. So actually working with teachers and practitioners and stakeholders to co-create what new curriculum might look like. And again, <clears throat> we can unpack that a, mm-hmm. a little bit more. But importantly for the Scottish model, and I hope this provides some sort of reassurance as well, is that when we talk about engaging in co-creation in Scotland, we also at this point also engage and co-create the implementation phase. Because again, where we've not always got this right in the past is that we're pretty good at producing documents, all this kind of extra guidance, and then it gets to the implementation stage and we struggle with that because we're not prepared for it. So within our Scottish model, the first stage is around the analysing, it's the gathering the evidence. The second stage is around co-creating with the profession, but also co-creating stage three, which we're calling sharing the learning and adopting. This is when we're trying some of these things out in schools. It's like the realisation stage, if you like, or implementation stage, as we've previously called it. Uh, and then there will be some sort of evaluation stage that will come onto that as well. And you would hope, because it's a cycle, that that evaluation stage would then feed into the evidence gathering for the next, for the next, for the next part of it. So it's not to say that some of these new ideas and this new curriculum is going to take 10 years to get into schools. Uh, we expect it to happen a lot a lot quicker than that, but it's obviously not going to happen immediately. Mm-hmm. So people shouldn't be worried about worried, worried about that. But the but the whole of the cycle should take about 10 years for it to be done meaningfully and in, and in a deep way. Mm-hmm. And that, I think that's a really important point, actually. Meaningful and deep. Yes. Yeah. I think we were joking about having been in this game for a while. Yep. And I totally agree that looking back... We've often, as a nation, implemented policy um, or changes, and we haven't focused fully enough, I don't think, yep. on how we support the profession and, and taking those changes forward. Yep. So I'm really excited, actually, yep. about the opportunity for us to to be taking a different approach. I'm, yep. I'm trailing the different approach mm-hmm. that I said I would come back, um, because Education Scotland, for instance, has been criticised historically for developing um, work in isolation, and, and not engaging fully yep. with the profession. Yep. I'm seeing this going forward in a really different way, a really energised way. Um, and you've tried out a number of approaches to be working differently with teachers and practitioners across Scotland. Can you talk a wee bit about that for listeners? Yeah, so <clears throat> so we've, um, we, we've, we've obviously tried to say, stay true to that model that I've described, that four-stage model. Um, and I suppose that the, the, the bit that, people are always naturally interested in is around the individual curriculum areas, you know, and subjects. So, so, so I suppose it's also important to remember that while we're true to the model, the four stage model over the 10, over the 10 years, every part of the curriculum that we will review will also have that four stage model within it. So there'll be cycles within cycles, which, mm-hmm. which, which starts to sound a little bit complex, but actually if, if you, if you, if you stay sort of true to that, um, it makes the whole of the process mm-hmm. pretty, pretty strong. The, the other thing that we've done, you know, as part of that is that we've um, stayed true to uh, service design approaches, in particular the Scottish approach to sort of service design. So it's thinking about curriculum as a service. That's what young people experience around that. Uh, and we're also always sort of thinking about the users of the curriculum. Now, the users for the, the users of the curriculum is um, a little bit more complex when we're thinking about, I suppose, education than if we were designing a, a product or a service is because we've got young people being users of the curriculum, but we've also got teachers and mm-hmm. practitioners being users of the curriculum you know you know as, as, as well so we've tried to stay sort of true to these process of service design and, and the and the and the other model and i suppose at, at a very very basic level you know what we're trying to do at the, at the moment and um you'll probably ask me a, a bit about this around sort of maths you know and, and, the other, and other areas where we've, where we've made a bit more of a start is that again uh we start off with with the evidence base we look at what does the existing evidence tell us around that now that's Sometimes international evidence, but we've also got a lot of data from Scotland as well, like in terms of um, you know national test results, SQA data, you know these these these, these sorts of things. Um, 
But we also then do some work around, so can we then identify what some of the big ideas and the big concepts are of a future orientated curriculum? And that, that bit of future orientated is really, really important because there's a danger in all of this is that we just recreate what Absolutely. we've got and we put a bit more clarity you know, around it. But actually, we, we know that we want the curriculum in Scotland to be sort of more future orientated. So then the difficult decisions that we've got to make is what are we going to take out so that we can get this other future orientated bit, bit in? And that's the bit that people, mm-hmm. people struggle, struggle with. Um, but once we've kind of established these these big ideas or these big concepts, these gives us this then gives us the ability to be able to select or deselect content, mm-hmm. you know, ar- ar- around that. And then from there, we can decide around what's the key knowledge, the skills and the understanding that we want young people to be able to develop from, from that. And then importantly, to use the language that we use in Scotland is how are we then aligning the broad general education to the senior phase yeah. to make sure that's true as well around, around that. And you talked there about future focused, Ollie, but I'm really struck... We, we talked previously about AI on, mm-hmm. our, on our podcast, <clears throat> yeah. but if you if you look at the pace of change, yeah. Yeah. that if we were only to focus on content, yeah. Yeah. then actually we could be out of date absolutely before yeah. The, yeah. B- before the work goes live. Yes. So it's as much as finding, as you say, a framework and a way of working yeah. that can cope with with future change. You did mention maths, um, yeah. and I know that that's the first area that that we're looking at. What can folk expect to see in terms of maths in the coming months? So, so, so I suppose there's a couple of things to sort of mention there, and um, and again, this is just meant to provide a bit more reassurance, more more than anything else, because of course there is a there is a danger of just focusing on maths, where you might end up in a situation where you could create the best maths curriculum in the, in, in the world, but that's at the expense of, of English or social mm-hmm. subjects or expressive arts or all the other parts, and that's that's not what's you know intended here, you know, around that. So we are. We are doing work on on, on on maths, but we've also started work now um, on English um, and literacy, uh, literacy, literacy and Gaelic, and we're starting work on science and health and well-being as well. And in fact, it's it's our intention that during this academic year that we'll start work on all of the curriculum areas sort of moving forward. But you remember that I was talking about that cycle that we've got mm-hmm. of review going, going around it. Now, um, what what we what we think is will, it will probably be quite likely is that. Um, well, we'll start work on all of these areas this year. Some of them will naturally finish sooner than others because we've got a stronger evidence base for mm-hmm. some of them, whereas with some of the other areas, we're having to go out and almost not, not create the evidence base from scratch, but do a lot more work around sort of pulling all those informations together. So, so for example, we've had a, a national STEM strategy for a number of years. Now, we haven't had a national strategy for RMPS or social subjects, you know, or even expressive arts, you know, around that. So we've got some evidence gaps mm-hmm. we need to sort of fill in there. So that's naturally going to take, you know, a, a little bit longer. But the advantage, I suppose, of the Scottish Curriculum for Excellence, which is highly flexible, where we're trying to get more clarity, is that as we phase in new parts of the curriculum, schools and local authorities will be able to adapt to that. That's a lot easier to do than it would be to go from a highly prescriptive curriculum to go to something which is very, very open-ended, which is one of the challenges that we had with CFE to, to, to start Definitely. with. So now I'll answer your question about maths. I hadn't forgotten about and that. And I'm, com- I'm coming Around back that. with another follow-up question on people. I'm holding them all in yeah, my head. Yeah, yeah. so that's a question, question on maths. So so again, um, the, the, the maths work is not starting from scratch. We, we've had for... Uh, for a number of years now, uh, a number of different sort of policy areas in, in maths. You remember making maths count or- originally. That's evolved into um, the national response for improving math- mathematics mm-hmm. and 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 RIM, which is a, a partnership approach between Education Scotland, uh, ADES, and you know and, and, the, and the Scottish government and the regional improvement collaboratives around that. Um, and actually, the national response to improving mathematics was all, already starting to look at the future orientated maths curriculum before this work was an- announced. So so again, we're not trying to create an additional thing with this. We've kind of folded that work together now around that. And what we're aiming to do, um, working with the National Math Specialist, um, who's been appointed by Scottish Government, is to try and get some of these uh, these, these big ideas for the future orientated curriculum ready so they can be tested with with, with teachers um, in December or in the early part of 2025 around, around, around that as well. And there's been lots of people that have been involved in that work. It's not just been... Education Scotland or the Scottish Government, you know, hidden away in a, in a room around that. Um, we've got a, a, a small core group that's come together, um, made up of 70% teachers and practitioners mm-hmm. and 30% stakeholders. That's the ratio that we're trying to get with all these, the rough ratio we're, we're trying to get with all this. And we've got a bigger testing group of about 100 people as well to test, the, to test these ideas before we then test to the wider, to the wider community. So what we're, tr- what we're trying to do is we're trying to get something which is, which is, 
partly finished, so it's ready for testing, rather than starting with a blank piece of blank with a blank piece of paper. But there's 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 nothing that we're going to be imposing onto the system mm -hmm. without people having their opportunity to give their views first around some of that. And I think that's really important, Ollie. That you know, so it will be draft for testing, but it genuinely again yep. means that it's <clears throat> not a new a new curriculum, yep. a new maths curriculum that's imposed without that development yep. piece. And, and I will come back to ask you about involvement in yep. in these yep. phases and, and how people can be involved. But I've popped into a few of the sessions that, that have been running and, and witnessed firsthand that mix of educators and key stakeholders. Yep. And you said there about partnership. I think it's really important. And we're, we're delighted that Education yep. Scotland is leading this work. But if we were doing that in isolation... Um, and it was the Curriculum and Assessment Board just mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. last week, and the the strength of buy-in from partners around yep. the table, around the the ways of working, the direction of travel was enormously yep. positive, which is so reassuring actually, because yep. this is really important. Yes, I'm going to come back to um, the the partnership piece to ask you a bit more about partners. But before I do that, I wanted to just pick up on a comment you made earlier about young people. Yes. So it's really important that we engage teachers and wider yep. educators in this process. But the curriculum is the curriculum that our young people in Scotland yep. experience. How are you involving young people in this work? So there's, there's two ways that we're doing that. So one, one of the ways, I suppose, might be to almost be described as being a bit historic at the moment, because because remember, we had the national discussion. Of course. So so um, national discussion, you know, commendably, um, you know, consulted with with thousands, 20, 20 26,000, you know, young, young people. And in particular, um, Professor Elmer Harris, Professor Carol Campbell went out of their way to consult with what you might describe as marginalised groups, people that haven't always got the, the views. So that, that became our initial evidence base you know, for, 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 do, for doing this work. Um, but it wasn't just the national discussion. You, you remember that when um, Ken Muir did his report around the structure of education agencies around that, he also asked questions around the vision for Scottish education. So again, there was a, a piece of work that he did uh, led by um, the Children's Parliament. And that's, again, we've got the young people's <laughs> views from, 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 that, from, from that as well. Um, so in the first initial stages of the work that we've been doing, we've been using that as our evidence base. Uh, evidence base because we, we feel that, that young people have been asked enough at the moment but as we now move into that next stage where we're starting to co-create the next part we're developing a sort of wider strategy with our okay. Scottish government colleagues about how can we get young people involved uh, a, a lot more with every every different step of the way. And actually if we invite if we if you and I come together for a third podcast we, are. we <clears> might <throat> want to have some young people as yeah. part of that conversation yeah. Yeah. Um, as you move into that next stage. You talked, bringing you back, we talked about the leadership of the work and the partners. And I'm really interested when you spoke about that kind of 70%, 30% mm -hmm. mix, because I know that was tried and tested too. You just yes. didn't make up those numbers. You tried different models. Can you talk to me a wee bit about the kind of stakeholder balance and, and who you've got in the rooms, either physically or virtually, as part of these conversations? Yeah, so, so, so first of all, I suppose the seventy percent it's a it's a that's a kind of like a guiding principle for us. It's not always like that with how like it, if it's sixty four yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But we but we but what we're tr what we're trying to do with all of this is to make sure that there's a heavy bias towards the people that work closely with children and young people. So those are the teachers, the principal teachers, our early year, our early years practitioners, and obviously school leadership teams mm -hmm. will be involved in that as well as we as we as we as we as we, as we go as we go forward. Um, and I suppose it just depends a little bit on the on the on the different aspects, you know, of the of the review cycle that we're that we're working on. So um, we've been doing a piece of work, for example, around um, learning for sustainability. Um, now we've got the learning for sustainability action plan, but we've been we've been going out to sort of try and think about what are the big ideas around learning for sustainability. We've also done it for financial education, um, for entrepreneurship, for careers education, and and the kind of model that we've used for that is that we've always tried to have. Uh, six, uh, six, six to eight academics in the in the room, um, coming from uh, from a variety of different mm -hmm. stances as around that. Um, six to eight stakeholders, so that might, for example, include a professional association. Um, you know, or for the learning sustainability work, it it might include you know, Greenpeace. You know, or keep Scotland beautiful, but someone that's got an interest in in that area. Um, and then we then we've actually kind of got our stakeholders, you know, our, ourselves when, when we're doing that. And what we've tried to do with with that as well is that we've tried to have uh, think about primary primary and early years again, six to eight six mm -hmm. to eight people that um, that have got have got an interest in this, but probably through their own admission wouldn't say 
they're brilliant at learning for sustainability around that, but they know it's important. They want to be better at it around that. Um, and then we've got between six to eight people from a secondary background, you know, around that as well, that, that probably would feel exactly the same. They probably wouldn't come from a geography department or a science department around that. It would be, it would be mixed. Um, and then we've got about sort of 16 people in the middle there coming from early years, primary and secondary background who are, you know, the people that are, that are doing the really interesting work that you've already talked about in their schools and settings around kind of learning for sustainability. So again, what we've tried to do with that model with describing it there is it's coming from the evidence base because we've got the academics there. It's taking on board that wider stakeholder uh, landscape uh, to, make, to make that work. Uh, you've got your people that are enthusiastic and doing really good work at the moment and the curriculum allows for that. But you've also got your pragmatists as well mm-hmm. that can come in and sort of say, well, that's all very well, but that's not going to work in, in, my sket- in my setting. So again, we've tested that model like over the last couple of years to sort of sort of come up with those sort of numbers and, and it seems to sort of work quite well. And the, and the results that we're, that we're starting to form um, around around some of this now really 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 exciting really 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 exciting and i'm repeating myself from earlier but that's not the kind of model that will have been used previously so this is new yeah and the opportunity to learn and and share our learning as part of that i've got so many questions ollie um but i'm going again something you mentioned earlier you talked about the opportunity to move from a bge to a senior phase what about employers Yep. So again, um, when we've when we've been doing some of these areas around sort of the core competencies, I mentioned these cross curriculum themes. Employers have been included as the stakeholder group uh, around 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 that, uh, and, and also of course we've um, we've used the existing evidence base when employers have been contacted through the other external reviews as well. So you remember independent review of assessment and, quali- and qualifications. Uh, there was an employers reference group, you know, which is mm-hmm. you know, which which is, which is part of that. So we've pulled on. Uh, the evidence from Louise Hayward and, and and colleagues around around that as well. So, because because there is a, f- a feeling, I'm just going to say this around, around this. This bit might be edited out, but there, there is a, there is a feeling at the moment that that different user groups have kind of been consulted a lot. Yeah. But are we actually listening? So we didn't really want to go out and ask the same questions again when we felt that evidence was there and it was and it and it was you know contemporary enough to still be relevant moving forward. And I think that's a really important point actually. Um, because you're right, that's some of the feedback that you hear. Yep. Young people in particular will often yes. talk about yes. the fact that people ask their opinion, but then they don't see change. Yep. Yep. So I think people will be reassured to have contributed to a number of, of the reviews um, that their feedback is, is yep. building into the wider changes, as well as any responses to the reviews, yep. but into wider changes in, yep. in Scottish education. And I guess then that also um, brings me back to my question around being involved. So I I think it's really exciting, as I said, that you're working really hard to involve so many um, educators, but there'll be folk listening to this today saying, well, I didn't know anything about this. So A, how do people get involved who are not already involved? And how will people find out about progress, direction of travel yep. um, in the coming months. So I suppose the, the first thing to say is that it's still early days, like with all of all of the work, and a, and a lot of this has been sort of testing, like so far, and we're now really just starting to build the momentum behind it. So there will there will increasingly be more opportunities for people to be involved um, around, around, around that around that. Um, so I suppose a, a couple of things to sort of signpost people people to is that um, on the website for. The, the Scotland's curriculum, so Scotland's curriculum dot, dot, dot Scott. That's where you can find out information about the uh, the refresh narrative of curriculum for excellence. Um, but you'll also soon be able to go to that website, and there'll be an up to date news blog about all the different things that are happening. So that's just something that we're just sort of going to try and keep, so it's there and it's going to it's going to be live. Mm-hmm. And opportunities will be advertised for that, and it will tell the story basically of how we're reviewing the Scottish curriculum. That, and that's that's the important part. So it's not just being done to people it's the whole story about how these these things have been in how these things have been involved um, we're also working really really closely with our partners and our stakeholders you've already mentioned the curriculum assessment board around that so for example when we were when we were looking for people to be part of the um, the cross-curricular work the learning sustainability the fine ed- education um, all of the professional associations kindly wrote out to all of their members to say these opportunities are available here's an opportunity for you to sign up you know around that and we do a similar thing um, with ADES as well from a local authority per, 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 perspective so there'll be different opportunities and these opportunities will be advertised and people have a, ch- a chance to kind of sign up for that um, I think I can also say that um, as part of this work in education in Scotland we're also going to be you know bring, bringing on board some more education in Scotland associates you know in particular teachers and practitioners to join in with this work at the work work as well so that's kind of beyond the consultation stage for the people that are going to do some of the heavy lift mm-hmm. you know around this as well so that will so that will be um, that will be available uh, and, and the third part particularly 
um, around the curriculum areas and subjects is that we're going to be starting to do a, quite a bit of work with existing networks. So um, let's just take math and numeracy as an example again, because that's the one that's sort of front and centre of our, 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 our minds. When we go out and we consult, for want of a better word, on what a new math and numeracy curriculum might look, look, look like, um, the networks that we know about, whether that's a network within a professional association, whether it's a network that we run nationally to Education Scotland, whether it's a local authority network for maths or numeracy teachers or people that have got an interest in, in that, they will all be cited you know, mm-hmm. on, on the work. So if you're a member of a network as part of what you norm, norm, normally do, you'll also have an opportunity to feed in, feed in as well. So I suppose there's different levels of involvement, which is something that we're trying to develop a bit differently this time round. That sounds great, Ollie. Ollie, I'm conscious of time. Um, we, as I said, we could probably have talked forever on this. Well, not quite forever, but we could have talked for a lot longer. I think we will need to come back and mm-hmm. have another yep. conversation as this work progresses, because it, you know, we're asking there about how we share the message. This is another really helpful yep. way, hopefully, yep. to keep people up to date and, and to continue to share the message. But Ollie, thank you, and thank you to the work that you and your team are, are taking forward. Um, I found this, even though I've been closely involved with the work, I found this really helpful and informative, and hopefully those listening will have too. So, so thanks, Ollie. Great. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to subscribe for notification of when a new episode is published. If there is a topic you would like to hear featured on this podcast, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Follow us on our social media channels for all the latest news from Education Scotland. Education Scotland is a Scottish government executive agency charged with supporting quality and improvement in Scottish education.